Uh, hi, can you hear me? Okay, nice. Okay, let me see. Wait a moment. Yes. No. Yes. Okay, so hi, everybody. So my name is uh, Andres, Andres Masigos, and you know, to this after today uh, with, with Thomas, Thomas Nielsen, we are going to speak, we are going to give you an introduction to, to probabilistic programming languages, okay? But let me, let me also give you an overview because and this afternoon is going to be an isolated session, okay? So we are going to introduce this afternoon probabilistic programming languages, but the idea is like we are going to use these probabilistic programming languages tomorrow when we start to discuss in depth uh, the concept of classic variation, the concept of variational inference. So we are going to illustrate how PBLs are, are an excellent tool that are powered by variational inference methods in order to really uh, have an easy way to, to, to build and deploy probabilistic AI systems. So today we are going to give your introduction and introduction to probabilistic AI. So we are going to, to introduce you the, the specific tool, which is called Pyro, a, a probabilistic programming language. And then tomorrow, we are going to have like three sessions, okay? So in the session before lunch, uh, Thomas, uh, Helge, and I, we are going to introduce you in the concept of variational inference. So you have seen variational inference this morning, but we are going to go in depth in this technique, which is a core technique for probabilistic AI. We are going to cover like the kind of classic variational inference, like the, the main concept behind variational inference. And then after the lunch session, we are going to go and going to, to cover one of more modern uh, variational inference techniques that are applicable to really fancy and nice uh, probabilistic models. And then in the evening, we are going to show you a specific kind, a specific kind of uh, a specific kind of uh, probabilistic models that are widely used today, which are called variational autoencoders. Antonio and Art today introduced a bit of these models, and then we are going to, to explain how. A variational inference also adapt for this very specific kind of, uh, of probabilistic models. And all of that is going to be in combination with several notebooks that we have prepared. Okay, so it will be a mixture of uh, lectures and then notebook with uh, time for exercises. Okay, there will be also TAs around to ask questions, okay, to answer questions. And well, let me, let me start. So the idea is like, I'm going to try to give you a kind of motivation of why PPLs are important in this field. So, so we already know, I think we all know that, you know, that this kind of technology, AI, machine learning technology, is a very interesting technology with a lot of very fancy applications, okay? The question is like, even though there is a very interesting technology, a lot of people really want to use this technology for solving their real problems. I mean, when you deploy this technology, when you, you really want to develop a technology, I mean, sitting in your computer, you know, collecting data, writing code and so on, you, I mean, quickly realized that this is like a, it's a highly technical task, okay? So in fact, I mean, uh, I mean, it's a complex task because first, I mean, it requires a highly qualified expert, okay? So I mean, this is a common picture when people speak about data science. And then here you, we, we can see here where machine learning sits, which is on the intersection of computer science and math and statistics. So you need to have a strong background in both subjects in order to, to be able to really deploy and code uh, these kind of systems. So another reason because it's really hard to, to, to deploy a machine learning system is like, even though you have a background, I mean, when you face a real problem, I mean, the number of choices that you have to make, okay, so it's very large. For example, this is the cheat sheet of the scikit-learn which is a nice toolbox for machine learning. And, you know, this is a cheat sheet, but you can see the number of options that you have in order to decide which is the most suitable uh, machine learning algorithm that you have to use. I mean, yeah. and we are not talking about uh, trying to solve a problem that doesn't perfectly fit within each of these categories that appear here, of which is, which is not solvable by each of these algorithms that appear here. Okay, yes, choosing the algorithm that is kind of baseline solution to your problem. I mean, it requires a good understanding of many different concepts, okay? And well, even though when you have done your machine learning code, I mean, okay, you have not finished. I mean, if you have your machine learning model, okay, even you have trained your machine learning model and then you want to use it in a real setting, okay, then it's turned out to be that the machine learning code is only a small piece of the whole system, okay? So you have to have something for data collection, something 
collecting for data verification, you have then to structure, then you have to, 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 to manage all the computational resources that are needed for these kind of tools, this kind of application. Then even when you have your machine learning model uh, trained, then you have to, to serve your machine learning model. And then you also have to monitor the, the, the performance of the machine learning model because data, I mean, because the, I mean, when you deploy in the wild a machine learning systems, I mean, you, you, you have to be very careful because suddenly the distribution of your data can change and then you have to retrain your model. So at the end, it's like the machine learning code is even like a small piece in the, 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 the entire of, of the entire system, okay? So which is the, the consequence of all of this? So the consequence of all of this is like, we have on one side, a lot of companies uh, looking forward to apply this kind of disruptive, fantastic technology, but <laughs> that requires a lot of expertise, okay? And what happens so that there is a big gap between the, the the, the, the demand of this kind of technology and the people that can really uh, is able to deploy this kind of this kind of technology and which is happening is like there is a shortage of AI experts and which is pushing the salaries really high and at the end the problem is like really only big companies big corporations have the, the resources to really deploy this machine learning system to to solve uh, meaningful problems okay so this is because I mean people. Uh, have the impression that we are in a kind of similar situation that we were 50 years ago, okay? So 50 years ago, we have computers appear. So at the time, you know, some people realized that it was a really relevant technology and a lot of companies out there, they wanted to adopt this technology, okay? But the problem is like at that time, uh, computers has to be coded in, in using a very low level programming language, something that really had to take care of a lot of uh, hardware details, okay? And this kind of low level programming languages are uh, really demanded, was complex and demanded of high expertise. I mean, it was really hard to, to, to arrive and use a computer in, in, in the 70s, okay? So because of the reasons I said before, like you have to really care about the memory and you have to do a lot of low level tasks, okay? Then people, develop high level programming languages. And the purpose of that was to, to make programmers focus on the application and create different layers of abstraction that when you are programming on top of a computer that you don't have to care about low level details, okay? And then this gives rise to high gains in productivity. Suddenly people was able to, to, to code much more tasks than before due to these high level programming languages like Java, C Sharp, whatever. Okay, and end up having a kind of effect of democratization of the software development. Okay, so just imagine like in the 70s, you tell someone there that, you know, that your kids of 10 years old, you know, a kid of 10 years old or 12 years old is able to, to, to code, you know, uh, uh, code some, write some code for, for, for a computer, it was completely unbelievable. Okay, and at the end that was, you know, I mean, was made possible thanks to this kind of high level programming languages where it is quite easy to, to, to code. Okay, so in that sense, I mean, machine learning has also seen kind of similar trend, okay? So, especially in the, in the field of deep learning, I mean, at the beginning, I mean, deep neural networks were, were very difficult to make them work because just coding deep neural networks in a computer was a very difficult task, okay? But today, I mean, just we have like a lot of, I mean, companies, communities out there, universities, they have developed a bunch of nice tools that will make us far, far, far easier to, to, I mean, to try and define a neural network. Okay, like imagine like for example, class. Okay, so just few lines of code and then you can just try a very complex uh, neural network. Okay, so the nice thing is of this, of this high, high of, of this toolbox, which are, you know, high quality, well maintained and also I mean, rely on high level abstractions. So, imagine like uh, in neural networks, these kind of different layers. This is one of the main abstractions in, in, in neural networks. It's like you don't have to, to worry about low level details. You don't have to worry about the memory of the GPU. Okay. And, you know, has really helped to increase the adoption of this technology. Okay. So, the question is is there something similar for probabilistic AI? Okay. Which are the high level? libraries in probabilistic AI that make us use this technology, you know, in a kind of easy way, no painful way, because sometimes when you look at the, at the details behind this, pro, this, uh, this inference algorithms, how to compute the Bayesian posterior variational inference, one can get the impression of, okay, oh my God, how, how I'm going to do that work? How I'm going to call 
all of that, okay? So you can imagine that some of you really want to go into detail, okay? But imagine that you only are interested in make probabilistic modeling, okay? So what happened is like, fortunately, we have also high level libraries for doing probabilistic AI. And the high level libraries in probabilistic AI are all called PPLs, okay? Are called probabilistic programming languages, okay? Probabilistic programming languages are kind of idea of high level programming languages, but you know, but they allow to, to, to deal with probabilistic constructs, okay? You will see details of that later. And at the end, they, they, they have a different, different level of abstractions, okay? So the idea of a PPL, this is the idea of a PPL, is like, you will have domain experts, you will have people like doing uh, natural language processing, okay? And you have different domain experts, and all of them, they will use the same probabilistic programming language, language to define their probabilistic models, okay? You, you define your probabilistic models that fits your need, that fits your problem, and then there will be another layer where this probabilistic programming model defined using this PPL will be kind of compiled, and there will be some machine learning, okay, uh, machine, some machine learning, machine learning algorithms that we are able to perform this approximate very, this approximate uh, approximate inference, and at the end, I mean, all this will give rise to a bunch of computations that will be performed in different, you know, different uh, and different like either a CPU or a GPU or even in a cloud or wherever. Okay, but if you are a domain expert, you don't have to worry about that. Okay, so that's that's the key idea of PPLs. And then in that sense, we, we go back to something that Antonio mentioned this morning. So when we are doing probabilistic AI, we always start with some knowledge, and then we want to answer some questions, okay? Then we make our assumptions explicit about how the world works. And then we build our probabilistic model, okay? Then we take our data. Then we discover patterns in our data. Then we make predictions. Then we explore our data. Then we criticize the kind of predictions, the model itself, the assumptions that we have made, okay? And then we go back, then we revise our assumptions, and then we proceed, okay? The nice thing of PPLs is like, doing all this cycle is going to be far, far easier. So instead of every time that you change your assumption, every time that you change your model, you will automatically have an approximate inference algorithms that will give you the possibility to make predictions. Okay, without the need to make ad hoc derivation or ad hoc changes to your, to, I mean, to your, to your algorithms, okay? So in some sense, PPLs aims to be what high-level programming languages was with respect to the low-level programming languages. It aims to be a way to use probabilistic AI in a more, much more democratized way, okay? And then trying to hide a lot of the complexities that are behind this technology for only those people that really want to go there and, 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 and understand, I mean, and develop a specific uh, approximate inference algorithms. Okay, so I'm going to give you a kind of quick, quick overview of the different PPLs because PPLs has been an idea that has been around for, for, for from the very beginning of the, of, of, of the area. So, I mean, we have something what we call the first generation of PPL that includes many different PPLs that were developed at that time, late 90s, early 20s. So all of them have the main focus of trying to be very, very general. Okay, they were extremely general to the point that we were able to, to represent any, pro, any Turing complete probabilistic programming, uh, sorry, any Turing complete probabilistic model. So it's like pretty, pretty general. So, and then the inference, how they perform inference was based on Monte Carlo method, you know? That was nice, which was the problem of these PPLs, that they didn't scale with too large data samples and high dimensional models. So suddenly at some point, the big data era arrived, and you know, and, and these kind of PPLs, they were not able to, to deal with large quantities of data and also able to deal with large models involve, in, involving a large number of random variables. So then, you know, a new generation of PPLs arrived, trying to fix these issues. So the idea is like, now, they change the inference engine instead of may instead of, instead, of, instead of being powered by Monte Carlo method, the inference engines were, were powered by message passing algorithms, variational inference method, okay, that made them 
scalable to large data samples and even to the to, to probabilistic models having like a large number of, of variables, okay? So for example, so Thomas and I and Helga and Antonio, we developed a myth and we were able to, to do inference on a model with one billion, okay? American billion of random variables, okay? It was very, very large uh, probabilistic model, okay? But which was the problem of these guys? The problem was that the probabilistic model family was restricted. We were not able to represent all probabilistic models. Okay, and then deep learning arrives. Okay, and then you know there were like a demand to model like complex nonlinear uh, relationships between random variables, like having probabilistic models, included deep learning constructs inside, and then there was the need to develop a new generation of PPLs, and then you know then appears something like TensorFlow probability, there's a peer pyro, we are going to talk about that, pi and c3 infer pi, I mean in Stan. Okay, and all of that, what they have in common is this kind of black box variational inference techniques, also some new advanced Monte Carlo methods. So this is something that we will cover also tomorrow. And the nice thing of this new generation of PPLs is like, they can scale to large data samples and high dimensional models. They really are quite general, even though they have a strong focus on probability models containing deep neural networks, okay? Perfect. And a common theme of all of them is like they rely, like the computation engine is based on deep learning frameworks such as TensorFlow, PyTorch, or Theano. Okay, so they are able to utilize specialized hardware like GPUs, TPUs, and so on. Something which is really relevant as well, which will make our life very easy when developing approximate, approximate variational inference methods is like they have, okay, sorry, uh, automatic differentiation method. Okay. That's the general idea, and this is where we are right now in terms of PPLs. And well, we are going to discuss this afternoon and tomorrow. We will use Pyro. It's a good probabilistic programming language. So I can say that you know the idea is not to give you an overview to this PPL. Okay. So the idea is like we are going to show you the main abstractions, the main ideas behind Pyro. So that's something that you learn, and then if you prefer to use another programming languages, or probably if another PPL appear in a couple of years, okay, they will be probably based on the same level of, of the same abstraction, and you will be able really to, to learn quickly this uh, other PPL, okay? So Pyro was initially developed by Uber, okay? You know, the car riding company, but at the end, you know, it was discontinued the development, some people left the company, and then, but at that time, I mean, I mean, it was a mature project and there was a community of contributors behind this project. So this community is still actively maintaining this uh, open source PPL. And there is also some dedicated team at the Broad Institute in the US. So it's a, I would say it's a, it's a, it's a high quality PPL. You know, down there rely on top of PyTorch. So there is a deep learning framework providing, uh, you know, this kind of GPU, TPU computation. Okay, and exactly, so as I said, yeah, there is this kind of, so you can also enable GPU acceleration because at the end, the, the main idea of these PPLs is to represent probabilistic programming, probabilistic uh, models containing deep neural networks. So, I mean, you need really to, 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 to use this kind of a specialized hardware, okay, for, for, for this kind of task, okay? And well, the idea is like we have this GitHub repo, okay? Perfect. So we are going to, I'm going to ask you to, to go to this GitHub repo. I think you can even access the GitHub repo from the GitHub repo of the probabilistic AI school. Okay. Let me see. So there is here, you know, the probabilistic AI 2022 on GitHub. There is this link. And then if you click here, then you end up in this other repo, okay? And here you have all the material for today, okay? And also for the rest of the days, okay? So, I don't know. Thomas is going to take over right now, but I don't know. Do you have any question you would like to ask at this point before we start really to work on Pyro? Is there any, anything you want to ask? Okay, nice. So, yes, Thomas.
Okay, can you hear me? I assume so. Okay, uh, so I will say a few words before we jump into the first exercise. So uh, the setup that we have for the rest of the day is that we will mostly be using uh, notebooks, uh, Jupyter notebooks, that we will run uh, using Google Colab. And uh, if you press these notebooks here, you should be redirected to the appropriate page. This here would be uh, the first one that you will, uh, that you will encounter. Uh, anyone who, we will spend about five minutes or so before we will take the first exercise. So if you have difficulties uh, getting access to the notebook, then uh, we can just take, uh, assist you with that during the exercise session, uh, which will start in roughly five minutes. So we will have, uh, for the rest of the uh, day, so around two hours, uh, we'll be looking at uh, these uh, notebooks. Uh, we'll also have a few um, breaks in between. So we'll have a break after this first exercise here. So in around 15 minutes, uh, where you are very much encouraged to get up and stretch your legs. And uh, then we'll go on for another uh, half hour, 45 minutes, and then have another break uh, together with exercise sessions. Uh, you are obviously welcome to continue with the exercises during the break, but uh, on the hand, it might also be nice to, to get a bit of fresh air. So we have, uh, what we are going to look at now is to just give you a very brief introduction to uh, Pyro, as, uh, as Andres mentioned before. So it will, the objective with these notebooks uh, will not, is not to make you experts within Pyro. It's to exemplify have chosen before because we find it relatively accessible and to be a nice way of introducing probabilistic programming languages. There are a lot of details that we are not going to cover that uh, you will hopefully be able to uh, pursue on your own uh, if you, if you uh, have a desire to really go into these details. You can also hopefully be able to pick up another probabilistic programming language uh, based on what we are going to cover here today. So uh, what you will see when you uh, follow the links that we provided, uh, you will be direct to this uh, student's uh, probabilistic programming uh, languages intro, uh, where you have uh, the first part here where you will be uh, installing the uh, packages that are needed. So in this case here, we have Pyro, which relies on Torch or PyTorch. So this is uh, being loaded and we have already done that and getting installed. And uh, then we'll, uh, for now, we're just going to introduce some of the very simple programming constructs that are being used in Pyro to specify probabilistic models. So the way that the structure, uh, the way that the notebook here is structured is that we will introduce the, these very simple programming features initially, and then we'll start to develop that into more sophisticated models. And you will also make extensions to these models yourself and try to analyze the models using uh, the, the functionality provided by Pyro. So since we're talking about probabilistic programming and uh, probabilistic models in general, so the basic thing is, or the ba basic concept that we are going to work with are distributions. And uh, Pyro provides a wide range, access to a wide range of distributions. So here are just a few examples, normal distribution, better distribution, uh, Poisson distributions, what have you. Uh, so this here is just a small list if you follow the link that we have up here, then you will have a, a you can find information about uh, a whole uh, the whole range of distributions that are being supported by by Pyro. So you create a distribution. Uh, in this case here, we have loaded in the package Pyro distributions as dist, uh, and then you uh, create a distribution. In this case here, we are creating a normal distribution with mean zero and a standard deviation of one, and it's stored in the variable normal, and then we have a normal distribution here with the specified parameters. Once we have a distribution, we can then create samples from that. So we can draw samples and you do that by calling uh, the function sample on your variable, your distribution variable normal that we've just created here. And then you can see that what you has returned is a so-called tensor. In this case here, it's a tensor consisting of one value Minus, zero, uh, minus one point something. So you have the 
values that are being sampled embedded within a tensor. And as we'll see later on, we can also have tensors of higher dimensionality. So you can think about these tensors here as a multidimensional arrays. So here we have an example of a, one such example. So now we are get, generating a sample from a distribution where we ask uh, that the sample has a particular shape. In this case here, it has three dimension where we have three, four, and five elements in each of the dimensions. And we have a tensor of uh, represented like this, or that we get out of it. We can also inspect, given that we have a tensor, we can inspect the dimensionality of that tensor using the shape function. So if we have, uh, here we have again, our sample that we draw from our normal distribution with a shape of three, four, five, and then we can query the shape of the sample that we just generated. And then we see that we have a torch, uh, a torch tensor that has size uh, three, four, five. Given uh, that we have uh, our samples, we can then also calculate, uh, calculate the likelihoods or log likelihoods over the samples that we've generated. So in this case here, we are looking at the, uh, calculating the log likelihood of uh, the samples uh, that we draw from our normal distribution. So if we want to calculate that, we call a uh, normal log prop given our sample, and then we get this range of numbers here, we get one value for each element in our tensor. Mm -hmm. And if we then want to calculate uh, the sum of the log props, then we have functionality that we borrow directly from PyTorch. In this case here, we use torch.sum, taking uh, as argument uh, the log prop of the sample that we've just calculated, and then we can uh, return a value here. Uh, we can also, here we've looked at a single normal distribution that we've calculated. We can also estimate, uh, uh, define multiple distributions directly within a single object. So in this case, uh, the specification that we have here, we are defining a set of multiple normal distributions within a single object. In this case here, we have a, a three normal distributions with different means but uh, in this case here, one, two, and three, but with a common variant or standard deviation of one. And uh, in this case here, we can see that we create our distribution, we sample from it, and then we get uh, a tensor consisting of uh, three values out, with three values corresponding to the three normal distributions that we've just created. And again, we can calculate uh, the log probability of the samples that we have uh, that we found. So this year was just a very brief introduction to some of the basic building blocks that we have in Pyro and which we are going to rely on for the rest of the day. Uh, and again, the main ideas here are the bait building blocks to recall is that we can specify construct distribution objects uh, from of different types of distributions. And once you have a distribution object, you can then sample from the distributions uh, by calling the function sample. And these are really the two key building blocks that we are going to use when specifying our models. So what you should do now, we've set aside 10 minutes uh, for this uh, very small exercise here, is just to make sure that you can get access to the notebooks that they run for you, and then play a bit around with uh, the code that is provided if before the exercise here, you, don't, you shouldn't go beyond the exercise specification. Just play around with the code. Uh, and uh, if you are more adventurous, you can also go into the uh, Pyro documentation up here and maybe work, uh, play around with some other distributions besides the normal distribution that we have here. So we'll have 10 minutes set aside for this exercise, and uh, then we'll take uh, a break afterwards and 10 minutes that also depends a bit on whether there are any problems uh, getting access to uh, to the notebooks and getting things up and running. Yes. And another thing, and uh, if you uh, noticed, uh, you probably have, that every third row is empty. So that means that we, the TAs will just come in through the rows here. To, to help you around. So if you just raise your hand, then either the two of us or the TAs will come and uh, assist you. 
Okay. Any questions that we want to ask now or which we can, otherwise we can just take it during the exercises. Okay, it uh, seemed that everything worked as it should with the, uh, with the notebook. Um, at least we didn't get any. So we'll start now. So what we are going to look at now is to introduce uh, models, uh, probabilistic models in Pyro, and again, using the uh, programming constructs that we introduced just before the break, in particular, the specification of distributions and uh, the way in which we can draw samples from the distributions. So uh, in Pyro, uh, models are basically uh, defined as stochastic functions in the sense that each time that you call a Pyro model, in this case here, a stochastic function, you will also uh, be returned a new sample. So you're generating samples from your stochastic functions, aka your models. And the underlying primitive operation that we have in these, uh, in our models, is uh, uh, the, the primitive stochastic function sample. So a sample in this case here in a pyro model corresponds to a random variable. So the, inter the, the sample statement that we introduced just before the break. So just to give you a very simple ex example of a pyro model, we have that specified here. So again, uh, in Python, which I don't think we've said that explicitly, but we assume that you at least are able to, don't assume much programming experience in Python, but at least being able to, to pass the code. Uh, so we define a model up here where we have our first uh, sample statement, pyro sample, and it is, uh, is uh, defined, is giving a name in this case here, it's uh, called temp because we are going to model uh, the, uh, the temperature uh, just as a, simple example. And uh, this temperature variable here follows a normal distribution with a mean of 15 and a standard deviation of two. And then our def uh, model definition up here then returns the sample, uh, the sample uh, temperature. And if you run this part of the code, then you'll also see that you return, we run that twice and uh, print out the results. In this case here, you can see that we get two values from our function, from our model, uh, and it's uh, the, and the two models differ, uh, the two values differ because we are calling uh, our stochastic function twice. Uh, yes. So we can also try to make this model here a bit more uh, interesting uh, by including, uh, by extending uh, the temperature variable or temperature model up here with a sensor variable. So in terms of, if we try to draw this graphically, in terms of a Bayesian network specification, we have a temperature variable on top, and then we have a, our sensor variable below, and then we assume that it's the temperature variable here that uh, has a causal effect on our sensor variable. And we assume that we have a conditional probability distribution associated with the sensor variable here conditioned on the temperature variable. And we also assume, as Antonio mentioned uh, earlier today also, that we have prior distributions over these variables. And the way, the reason why we do that is that we have here sort of, this is the true temperature, and this is what we have measured with our sensor. But since our sensor is noisy, we also want to take this sensor noise into account when specifying our model. And this is what we're doing up here. Good, so if we want to extend our model specification with our sensor variable, so we have a composite model, then we just introduce two variables. Our first variable up here, the temperature variable, that's the same model as we had before, uh, giving the name temp and with the normal distribution, just as we had before. The sensor variable depends on the temperature variable. It has the name sensor given a normal distribution, but in this case here, our normal distribution is given a mean corresponding to the temperature variable or the sampled value from the temperature variable that we've just uh, given. And then the noise of the sensor is modeled over here. So we assume that we have a standard deviation of one associated with the temperature or with the sensor variable, uh, but uh, given the mean of the, uh, the exact temperature. And if we run this part here, then we get two values out. 
so we are returning both the sensor value and uh, the temperature variable and the sensor variable uh, samples from those. And that means that we have a tuple containing these two values uh, and each of the values is then placed within a tense object. This method that we've now defined here where we return two variables or two values also means that we've here defined a composite function that actually defines a joint distribution over two variables uh, given uh, by the probability of the temperature variable multiplied with the probability of the sensor variable given the temperature variable. So given like this, yeah. Uh, in the model specification that we have up here, we have a very simple relationship between the temperature and the sensor in the sense that the sensor, the mean of the sensor variable is just equal to the temperature variable. Since we're working within a probabilistic programming language and as uh, Andres mentioned previously, we have much more expressivity or we have quite a lot of expressivity in these languages. In particular, this language here is Turing complete. You can actually have any kind of relationship between the temperature variable and the sensor variable up here. And we also, later in this notebook here, we'll also explore slightly more uh, sophisticated relationships beyond this very simple one that we have here. Good. Uh, Pyro also has a bit of uh, some functionality to visualizing the models that you specify. And uh, we try to be consistent in doing that, illustrating that in the notebooks and uh, the Simplest way of doing that is simply co to call pyro render model and then providing as argument the model that you just specified. And if you do that, then you get a nice illustration from pyro that looks like this, uh, drawn directly from the model specification that we have on top. So we'll try to do that. So one thing is to specify your model in, uh, in a probabilistic programming language like that, which may not be that which can, especially if you construct large models, be difficult to, uh, to, to, to get an overview of. In that case, these visual representations here can be quite helpful. Uh, one thing is we have our model specification here, but in the end, what we want to do is to do inference in these models and also to learn models or learn distributions over unknown, unobserved quantities in our models. And for doing that, we are going to rely on Pyro's inference uh, engines. And this is just something that we are going to use as a black box today and dig much more into detail about that tomorrow. You already had a bit of introduction to, uh, to inference algorithms earlier today, but this is really sort of the, the main uh, focus area for tomorrow's uh, lectures and tutorials. But we will be relying on Pyro's inference engines, and uh, we have specified a bit of functionality here that is hidden within the notebook. Uh, and uh, so it will all be, so be hidden in the notebook that you have access to. But just to give you a bit of insight into what is going on, uh, I think you have already gotten a few hints uh, earlier today about it. Then what we are aiming for here is to uh, use the functionality provided by PyTorch. So where we are doing, uh, which is, provides uh, functionality for doing uh, optimization, gradient-based optimization. And this is also what we are going to do here. So uh, tomorrow you will see how we will transform our inference problem into an optimization problem that we will solve using gradient descent. And uh, this is basically what you'll also see here, that we have a stochastic variational inference objective. We have a loss function specified, given here, much more detailed tomorrow. And then we are basically going to iterate. During each iteration, we are going to step to take a step along the gradient and trying to minimize or maximize our objective function. But uh, I won't go into any more details about this today. You'll see more tomorrow about this. So once we have our inference algorithms available to us, we can start to do some more interesting things with the models that we've specified. So you, want to, you may want to ask, what is the actual temperature in the room uh, given that I make and have an observation from my sensor? In that case, what we do is to insert evidence on our sensor variable that we specified down here. And we try to be a bit consistent in uh, color coding the observed variables here gray to indicate that these variables are observed, whereas the 
variables or the nodes that you have up here with no color or being colored white, that these are the unobserved quantities that we are interested in. To uh, introduce observations into our model, uh, what we do is to introduce, uh, to specify up here that we have our temperature and we have our sensor. We have observations on our sensor. So when we construct our, uh, make our sample, then we specify here that we have, uh, take a keyword ops, and that's equal to a dictionary that we've specified up here containing our, the name of the sensor. Uh, or the name of the variable in this case here that we specify together with the observed value. Here we assume that the sensor is observed to be, to have the value 18. This dictionary here is provided as argument for our model, our stochastic function. And we then provide our sample statement with the observation down here. And this notation over here simply means that we're indexing our dictionary and extracting the value of the key sensor uh, and providing that to our sample statement. And if we do it like this, then we can also again render our model and Pyro follows the same convention. So that also here we see that our new sensor variable that we've just created is now colored gray because it is also provided this uh, keyword ops, meaning that is being observed. So given our model, we can now, and we have our observation, where we see that our sensor has a value of 18, we can start to query about, for instance, the temperature variable that we have here. So we are interested in the posterior distribution over the temperature variable, given that we observe the sensor variable to be 18. We can calculate that using base rule, or we can, in this case here, we'll do these calculations here using Pyro's functionality. And uh, specifically, we'll first use the function that we have up here, SVI. So that was the function that I we started out to have hidden above, but which I gave sort of a very brief introduction to. So this is a wrapper of the functionality that provides the inference uh, in Pyro. And uh, then we provide that with the arguments, the model that we have specified, the observations that we just defined that the sensor uh, is observed to be 18. And then we have another argument plot equals true just to uh, uh, provide a bit of plotting functionality to see what's going on. And when we do that, it we break because I didn't run this one up here. Like that. Let's try again. And now we should get some results. So first of all, again, just to uh, provide a hint to our SVI implementation. We again see here, here in the output, we have some steps, 0, 100, 200, 300, 400. So again, these are the uh, steps that we perform during our gradient descent. We have some values from our loss function that we are outputting here. And uh, the plot that we see down here, that's the loss function that we are trying to optimize with respect to. Uh, but again, we'll say a lot more about that tomorrow. But uh, this was just to give you a bit of insight into what is actually going on here. And so that you have a bit of an idea why you see the results that you do here. But in addition to that, when we get, when we run our code uh, from the SVI, we calculate, uh, we get some updated uh, estimates of our distribution. In particular, we can access Pyro's so-called parameter store that contains the variables or the parameters of the variables which we are interested in. In this case here, we know that the names of the parameters for the temperature variable are called autonormal.locks.temperature because we are assuming that we have a normal distribution over the temperature variable you know, in terms of the posterior distribution that we're interested in. It has a mean value and location and it, has a, and it has a standard deviation, uh, which is, I think we may have a small mistake in this case here. So this here should be scales and not locks. So uh, let's just see if we can fix that. Scales like this. And we have a result here. So 
we will upload uh, another version uh, a bit later here. But that is then how we can access the parameters that have been calculated uh, uh, by Pyro uh, from the parameter store. And the names of these, the variables uh, or the parameters that we specify up here, these names you can find in the SVI function that we have specified here. So you know what kind of variables that are, are being used or the names of the parameters are being used. Uh, yes, so here we have uh, an observation from, uh, we make inference based on one observation. We can also do that with several observations. So let's assume that we have make an observation about the temperature at different days. So let's say we have 10 days, we make an observation of the temperature using our sensor on each of the days. So in that case, what do we want to do? Well, we construct a new uh, model. And in this model here, we uh, take as argument our data. In this case here, we packed it into a dictionary, again, with the key sensor. And now we specified our observation in a torch tensor. And these are sort of 18, 18.7, 19.2, and so forth. So think of these as observations, one for each day. This dictionary is provided as argument for our model. And then down here, we are, going, we are constructing a for loop where we are iterating uh, over the number of elements within our dictionary or number of elements within the values assigned to the key uh, sensor here. So we take out, this is what the shape zero provides. So it tells us basically how many elements are in the, in the tensor that we see here. And then for each uh, element in our data set, we construct a temperature variable, again, using the same construct as before, pyro sample. Now we have different days. So we also uh, name the variables accordingly. So in this case here, we are using a so-called Python F string, where we are setting up creating a temperature variable and then with a subscript uh, I, with I indexing the particular uh, uh, entry that we have in our data set. And each of these uh, variables here are associated with a normal distribution with the same mean of 15 and a standard deviation of two. And then together for each of these temperature variables, we also create a sensor variable. Uh, and again, same naming convention. We have one sensor variable for each of the days and it has a normal distribution with a mean corresponding to the temperature. And we again introduce our, use the uh, keyword ops up here, over here to introduce the observation data that we have provided to our model into the sensor variables. We can run that and visualize our model. And as you may expect, this model structure here is not extremely interesting. What we just get is a repetition of the same model specification for each of the days, one for each element in our data set, but they are completely disconnected from each other. And again, but uh, again, also observe here that we have the sensor variables being gray, indicating that we expect observations on these variables. We can uh, do inference in this slightly more complicated model uh, using our SVI function. And uh, we are again doing optimization, providing a loss value. And again, for each of, uh, uh, we provide here also the inference results. And now we have a whole list of different results being uh, produced, one for each of the variables that we have or the unobserved variables in our model, in this case here, the temperature variable. And again, that's provided by our SVI functionality that we have here with the verbal statement set to true. One minor thing worth noticing here is that even though this model here in terms of complexity or the relationship between the variables are not particularly interesting, you, what we can on the other hand point out is that with very few lines of code, we are starting to be able to construct rather large models in terms of number of variables here. So again, now we're sort of alluding to uh, the power of probabilistic programming languages even though the model is not that interesting. Now, so far we just looked at inference over a quantity that we may be interested in. We can also start to think in terms of doing actually learning in these models. So let's uh, try to make the model a bit more complicated or the setup a bit more complicated. So in our model before we, we had a 
basically a model for each of the days. We assumed that we knew what the mean temperature for each of the days should be. That was what we'd specified up here to have a fixed value of 15 over here. But what if we didn't know that? So in that case, we may try to model that in our, in our language. So, and we could pose it as a estimation problem. In this case here, just to take the simplest approach first, we'll pose this as a maximum likelihood estimation problem that uh, Antonio also uh, talked about earlier today. So what we are looking for here is, uh, we call mu, that's our unknown quantity that we're interested in, the mean value, the, mu, the mean value mu that goes into the temperature variable for each of the days. And that is found by taking the maximum value of our likelihood function that we have here, the marginal likelihood function, where we have the sensor, uh, the observations uh, in our data set from S1 to Sn here. Mu is the quantity that we're interested in. And from our model specification, we can also express it like this. We have a product on e over each of the days where we have the sensor given the temperature variable uh, multiplied with the probability of the temperature now conditioned on mu. So that is the unknown mean value that we could be interested in. We marginalize out the temperature and when we consider all the days of taking the product of these. Uh, in terms of a graphical specification of our model, it would look like this. So we have our unknown quantity mu up here that is shared by the temperature variable for all the days. And if we do it like this, uh, we can start to, we can specify it in our model here. So uh, the first thing to notice is this new value or this new line that you haven't seen before. Here we introduce a new construct. We are going to, in particular, pyro.param. So this means that we create a parameter, mean temp in this case here, that pyro is going to optimize over. It needs to be specific given a, uh, initial values for the optimization. And here we sort of more or less randomly just chosen that it should be the value 15, again, wrapped in a torch tensor. This mean temperature variable is then used as a parameter for our normal distribution that goes, that is defined for our temperature variable here. So it's mean temp is now our location, the mean value of the temperature variable created for each of the days. And again, we have the same construct with our sensor, just as we had before, that the sensor is conditioned on the temperature variable. And we assume that the mean of the sensor variable is equal to the temperature variable. And let's try to run that. That we can render our model again. And here you may notice I've recreated render parameters to true, meaning that we also visually display the parameter that we've created in our model, in this case here, mean temp. And here you can again notice that we have the same structure in our graphical representation as we started out with. We can do inference now, again, using our SVI function from before. Uh, so if we run that, providing the model and the observation, we are again doing, going through our optimization steps, printing out the loss functions and getting an estimate at the end of the mean value. So mean temp is now 19.56. So this here is the maximum likelihood estimate of the mean temperature parameter that we have introduced in our model. So we explicitly go in and pick out the parameter that we just created in our model called mean temp and output the value of that variable after optimization. And again, pyro param is what allows or which informs Python or pyro that this is one of the parameters to be optimized. Yes. Yes. Yes, so what basically goes on is that in the SVI function, we are formulating, uh, reducing our inference problem to an optimization problem where we also specifying pyro parameters to be optimized. So this parameter here will be jointly optimized together with the other parameters in that is hidden underneath. And in this case here, we are trying to optimize it from a maximum likelihood perspective. Yeah.
Yes. Yes, uh, so you're completely right, and maybe we should have pointed it out before. We actually discussed whether we should do that, so it's a good question. Uh, so the reason why we see it here that it's decreasing is because we are relying on the underlying machinery of PyTorch, where we are generally trying to minimize a loss function. And we are what we will see tomorrow on when we is that what we actually want to do when we do variational inference, which is what is going on here, we want to maximize our elbow. But in this case here, we're just minimizing the negative of the elbow and that's expressed as our loss function here. Yeah. yeah definitely. No, so this year is also so. This is what uh, Andres also mentioned. The release third generation probabilistic programming languages, all of them rely, or most, if not all of them, rely on underlying deep learning toolboxes, which are based on gradient opt based optimization techniques. And this is also what we see here. So in Pyro, there's no uh, functionality to really do these types of calculations here analytically, uh, not for general models at least. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, one well, question. Yes. It could also be made a parameter. So this here is what we show here is just to the, the first step in trying to set up a learning framework. If we start to introduce the, uh, the standard deviation as a parameter, we also need to keep in mind that the standard deviation, it shouldn't be negative. Uh, and uh, so, so it, it makes things a bit more complicated. So this is really just to try to set the scene for the basic constructs that you need in order to specify models uh, and later on do learning and uh, taking it one step at a time where we are now just looking at the principles, pyro principles of doing uh, likelihood-based learning in this case here. Yes. You would just need to be a bit more careful to avoid these issues about uh, negative values. Okay. Good. Uh, let's see. We came from. So we had our learned model here, and we find uh, and and we ended up with a single point estimate for our value. So then that was this nineteen point five six something. That was our maximum likelihood estimate for the point estimate uh, that we had for our mean temperature. Now, we would like to now pro uh, position this here within our Bayesian framework, the Bayesian learning framework that you heard uh, quite a lot about already, uh, quite a lot about today. So how we do this is to treat our unknown quantity as an random variable, just at the same level as we talk about random variables, the unobserved random variables in our model, in this case here, the temperature variable. So if we want to show this graphically, what we have is a model structure that looks like this. So we have now, before I didn't have a circle around this to indicate that this was really a constant, so it was a parameter to be optimized. Now we have a circle around, so we have uh, specified this here as a random variable in the same way as we have the temperature variables here. It also means that our model now has some uh, different properties compared to the models that uh, the model that we saw before. In particular, you have a diverging connection uh, as Antonio introduced. So that means that you can look at the deseparation properties of the model and now see that this day one here is actually 
deconnected with the other days. So the variables at day one are deconnected with the variables in the other days. So we have dependencies across days in this model here. So now we're also getting a slightly more sophisticated model from uh, a dependency point of view. And we can introduce, uh, try to do learning in this case. Now we were interested not in a point estimate of the mean value, but in a distribution over the mean value. And uh, to do that, we just flip, uh, go from having a pyro parameter statement up here to a pyro sample statement, creating this here as a random variable. And then we have the rest of the code that you see down here is identical to what we had before. We can run the code and uh, we can visualize our model. And we again now see that temperature now appears as a random variable up here, just as we had before. We can now do inference now model. And again, inference here means that we are looking at the posterior distribution over the mean value given our sensor observations rather than getting a point estimate. And we again use our SVI functionality for that. And here I'm also printing out a bit of timing information. You will see why uh, shortly. But we again, everything here is being uh, driven by optimizations, uh, the variational inference. And we output at the very end, the mean value, uh, the temperature mean value given our sensor observation. And that's defined as a normal distribution with a particular location and the scale that we have here. And uh, if we want to point out a uh, thing to notice here is that we are no longer looking at a point estimate, but we are looking at a distribution over an unobserved quantity. So if we want to compare that with our maximum likelihood estimate, this is what we get. So the maximum likelihood estimate is what you got with the, uh, that you got is the orange line that you see here, which is just a single point estimate that really doesn't reflect anything about the uncertainty that we might have in our domain. Whereas uh, the curve, the blue curve that you see here is our distribution over this unobserved quantity. So the uh, posterior distribution over the mean temperature variable. Now, um, going just a quick point uh, uh, notice. So I mentioned this about the timing information and the result of the timing information we had down here. So it took 7.3 something seconds to do inference here. Uh, quite slow for this rather simple model that we have. We can uh, speed things up a bit because we can use a, another pyro construct called plate within our models that allows pyro to realize that the days that you have here are actually conditionally independent given the mean temperature variable that you have up here. So that is from using this, uh, we can see that from the graphical structure here again, you have the diverging connection on top, meaning that the, um, the days are conditionally independent given the mean temperature. And this type of information can be exploited in Pyro for making inference a bit faster. Uh, yes, we have a question. Uh, that's simply uh, because we, uh, it's based on, we also here provide a prior distribution uh, that is balanced with the number of observations that we are taking in. So, uh, yes. 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 And this is actually something that you also have a chance to play around with in just a few minutes. So uh, Pyro's plate construct uh, allows us to specify what kind of conditional independences that we have in our model. And uh, it is very similar. So we only need to make a small change to our model structure. So this here is the model specification that we had before, except for this line. So before we had used four loops to iterate over our number of data points, creating uh, two variables for each data point. Using a for loop does not allow Pyro to automatically infer that we have conditionally independences between the days conditioned on the mean temperature variable up here. But if you change that and introduce a Pyro plate, so with Pyro plate, we are providing a name for it. 
and specifying how many elements in our plate that we are iterating over, then we are also telling, in this case here, a bit manually, that these variables that you have here are conditionally independent given the mean temperature. How that will look if you render it in pyro, then it would be visualized like this. So this here is a standard way of specifying plate notation. So you have these boxes here with the part down here indicating how many times do you see these variables being replicated. So the plate notation here is really just syntactic sugar that you can put in, but it also in this case here provides pyro with additional information that it can use during inference. And once we have that, we can start to speed up inference a bit. And uh, now from our seven seconds, we are now down to 1.8 seconds or so. And this is a simple model, but in large models, then it's really going to have a huge impact if you are able to exploit the conditional independent statements in your models. Good. Uh, we have a small exercise now. So you should, what you should do now is to play around with this part of the notebook here and try to investigate in particular questions like we just heard uh, before during the lecture, what kind of effect does changing the prior have on the results that we get? Uh, what happens if you change the scale of the prior? Uh, what happens if you increase or decrease the number of data points that you have relative to the prior information that you're provided with? So this exercise here is really to get a better feel for pyro, but also a better feel for the effect of prior distributions on uh, pos the posterior distributions that you calculate relative to the number of data points that you have. And uh, we have set aside a bit of time for this. Uh, and it's, uh, so we've set aside 10 minutes uh, for this exercise. And after that, we will also have a, a small break before we continue. But, and again, we'll be around. So just raise your hand if you have any questions. Yes, probably it's run off out of battery. No. Oh my God, it's going to be hard to go and <laughs> speak with the mic. So, well, so we are going to continue and then we are going to, you know, we are going to move further. So we, we started with a very simple model. Just one random variable. Then we started with a model with two random variables. Then we started with a model with a for loop replicating these two random variables. Then we added another random variable on top. You know, just realize how we are slowly increasing the complexity of our model, okay? And just realize how we just have to change the code of the model. Then we were able to make inference without touching anything else, okay? So we just focus on the model. Then Pyro took care of the inference part. Okay, you were able to change the model. Anyway, so we are going to continue in that trend, trying to make a bit more complex probabilistic models. Perfect. So we are going to assume very kind of toy, stupid example, but give some kind of motivation. So imagine that you run an ice cream shop, okay, and then you record the, the number of ice cream sales and the average temperature of the day. Okay. And for that you have a sensor. Okay, perfect. And then you, okay, then you have the following questions. Okay, yeah, remember this box loop I saw you before? You have a question, you have data, and you have questions. And your question is, does the temperature affect the number of ice creams that I sell every day? Okay, this is a reasonable question, okay? And you know, we do probabilistic AI, okay? And we have data. And let's try to make that like me a probabilistic model. And based on the probabilistic model, we will extract conclusions. Okay. And based on that, we will try to go further and extract better conclusions. Okay. So the idea is like we are going to model how the temperature affects the ice cream sales. We are going to assume that yes, the temperature affects the ice cream sales. And we are going to create a probabilistic model reflecting this assumption. Perfect? Yes. And this is the kind of probabilistic model that we have. Okay, so let me see. So what we have down here, and sorry for the naming, but here what we have is like 
sensor measurements of the temperature. Perfect. But you know, this guy, this random variable, okay, is within this plateau, which means like I have a bunch of random variables. Perfect. I have multiple, several random variables, okay, which is going to represent the sensor measurements of the temperature across different days. Perfect. Okay. You know, as we saw before, we have access to the sensor measurements of the temperature, but you know, is I have the real temperature of the day. Perfect. And this is because I have this guy pointing to the sensor measurement because it's the real temperature, the one that defines what my sensor reads. Perfect. Okay. Then, well, I have the sensor measure the, the, the sensor measurements of my temperature, but I also know how many ice creams I sell every day. Okay, perfect. Then I'm going to introduce another random variable representing the number of sales, the number of ice creams that I sell every day. Again, this random variable is within this plateau. Why I place it here? Because I have you know data about ice cream sales every day. Okay, so every day I introduce a random variable representing how many ice creams I have sold this particular day. Perfect. Okay. The question now is, this is my assumption. Assumption is, does the temperature affect the number of ice creams that I sell every day? That's my question. Then I have this arrow pointing here, which means that the temperature is affecting this random variable, okay? But first question is, why I don't have an arrow from this guy to this guy, okay? Why I have it from this guy to this guy? Any, anyone have any idea? So I'm going to frame it in a different way. Is the sensor measurements defining the number of ice creams that you say? No? Imagine that your sensor start to make, you know, gets, just breaks, start to give you bad data. It's going to change the number of ice creams that you sell. No. What is really affecting the number of ice creams that you sell? The real temperature of this day, okay? This is the, 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 the true quantity which is affecting the real temperature of this day. Do we observe directly this quantity? What we observe? The sensor measurement, okay? Why this guy is not in gray color and this guy is in gray color? Because what we observe is the sensor temperature, okay? Perfect. And the temperature is affecting the number of ice creams, ice, ice creams that I sell every day, okay? That's the kind of assumption that I make, perfect? Okay. But you know, we have this sensor temperature, sorry, so the number of ice, of ice creams that I sell. This is a random variable. Every time I define a random variable, what I have to do? So yes, be, be, be careful with that, okay? So random variables define the reality out there, okay? Which is the number of ice cream, ice creams that I say every day, perfect? But every time I introduce a random variable to model the reality out there, I need to attach a probability distribution, perfect? So which is a probability distribution for this guy? Well, first thing, we are talking about a guy taking continuous or discrete values. How many ice creams? Do I sell 1.5 ice creams? No. I say zero, one, two, three, no? Discrete values, okay? So that's the first idea. So then I have to choose, you know, a probability distribution over discrete variables, okay? Just to make your life easier, okay? So, and there are quite a lot. Which one we decided to choose in this particular case? Something which is called a Poisson distribution, okay? You know, maybe you're familiar, maybe not, but at the end, this guy is going to give you a probability value for each of the observations of your random variable, perfect? Okay. Then we have the Poisson distribution. The Poisson distribution is going to define the distribution of the number of, say, of, the number of ice, ice creams I sell every day, perfect. Every distribution, so first, random variable, then the distribution, Poisson, okay? But you know, the Poisson has one parameter, 
It's like the normal distribution. Normal distribution has two parameters, then the Poisson has one parameter, and then we have to define this parameter. Okay? The, the parameter of the Poisson is the rate. Okay? The parameter of the Poisson. I change the parameter, then I have a different distribution. Perfect. The question here is like, I have this linear relationship, which is alpha, which is kind of less, I mean, let's be a kind of constant value, okay? And then you have beta, which is kind of constant value, okay? Unknown, perfect, it's an unknown value. Multiplying the temperature, what does it mean? It means like, my assumption is like, I say every day some fixed quantity, okay, of ice creams, okay? And then depending on the temperature of the day, I may say a bit more or a bit less, okay? This is what I, this is, this is my assumption, perfect? And this is the modeling that I make. I say like the sales follow a portion where the rate is a linear relationship, where impacts of the real temperature multiplied by this parameter beta plus another parameter alpha. These are two unknown parameters. I don't know these parameters, okay? Then I'm going to be Bayesian. What happened with the quantities, with, with the quantities I don't know in a Bayesian setting? What do I do? I treat them as a random variable. Then I have alpha, random variable, beta, random variable. Okay, perfect. Now, every time I, I add a random variable, it's so nice, but what do I have to do? I have to define the distribution of this random variable. Okay, in that case, the distribution is of both is going to be a normal distribution. Perfect. Why a normal distribution? Because it's a simple one, a standard one. Okay. Every time I define a distribution, what I have to do? I have to define the parameters of this distribution, okay? It's always these three steps, random variable distribution and the parameters of the random variable, okay? In this case, this parameter reflects prior knowledge, okay? So normal, zero center, 100 standard deviation. I mean, it's like very flat prior. It's like, I don't really know which are these two quantities, okay? Perfect. I can go further, okay? For example, if beta is positive, it's going to be beta, beta is positive or negative. So how many of you bet that beta is going to be positive? It's like higher temperature, higher number of ice cream sales. Okay, there. I will say that, okay, perfect. But then I, have, I can change the pressure of beta, okay, and then use like a truncated normal pressure. So beta has to be zero or higher than zero, okay? So yes, I just go through the documentation of Pyro and then I find the proper prior distribution and then I use it, okay? But we are not going to do, it, to do it now, perfect? That's the way. The question is once we have defined our model representing our beliefs in this specific problem, then we go to Pyro and then we code the model, okay? And it's nice, but we don't have now, unfortunately, the space in the screen to see this graph, okay? And this definition, but at the end, if you convince yourself, this is the kind of uh, pyro model that we have. Again, sales, okay, which represents the number of ice cream follow a Poisson, which is a rate, the rate is alpha plus beta multiplied by the temperature, the real temperature of the, of the day, which is modeled as a random variable with a normal distribution. Then we have the sensor uh, measurements for the temperature, and then we have alpha, beta, okay, which are again, the unknown quantities, and then they have the normal distribution. It's just exactly the same idea. If I render this model, you know, I click here, I render the model. I have exactly the model that we were talking about. Okay, perfect. Okay, do I have to do anything else to make inference about alpha and beta? What do we have to do with Pyro? Exactly. We need some data, and this is something which is already provided here, okay? So I have my data, and once I have my data and I have specified my model, do I need to have anything else? Yes. Have to click, run, okay. <laughs> Perfect. And then you click run, then you wait, okay. Then, you know, at some point, converges to the solution. And here, what we have. This is the parameter that we already have about the mean, okay? 
and these are the new ones. Remember, alpha is like the average number of ice creams that I sell every day. So according to this model, I sell like almost 40 ice creams every day, and this is the standard deviation. And according to this, uh, to this parameter, you know, for every Celsius degree that I increase the temperature, I sell 0.5. more ice creams but there is again uncertainty about this part perfect okay nice and nice when the exercise comes okay now you know you give some thoughts and then you say oh my god okay okay i'm getting i'm getting information perfect so i'm going to try to go deeper okay then you say but well you know humidity also plays a role here no perfect i would say like high humidity is also affect the mood of people and you know that you are more willing to buy an ice cream okay perfect and then you buy a new sensor for measuring the humidity perfect and you record some data okay so the exercise is how can you exploit information about humidity on top of the information that you have about temperature to model how the sales the ice cream sales behave Okay, this is the exercise. Okay, again, I don't know. I will quickly go through the model part. Okay, but I think you get the idea. So, sensor measurements should be inside, sorry, sensor measurements about the humidity should be inside or outside the plateau. Sensor measurements about the humidity. So, how many times I measure the humidity? Every day. So it's going to be replicated. So it's going to be inside the plateau, okay? Is the sensor measurements of the humidity really impacting the sales, the ice cream sales? Is really the sensor? No. What is impacting the ice cream sales? The true humidity. Do we observe this quantity? No. Do we have a problem with unobservable quantities in probabilistic AI? No. What do we have to do? Define a random variable. To define a random variable, what do we have to do? Define the distribution. And beside that, we have to define the parameters that define the distribution. And so on and so on. Okay, perfect. So how much time do we have? We are just, we just run out of time, no? Exactly, so, okay, 10 minutes later, okay? But the, you know, the question is, let me see, that we will upload the solution to these notebooks, okay? That's the point. So take that as like a learning material. We also have even one extra exercise where we are a bit more farther in the idea, like we have like temporal information, you know, the sales, the sales of ice creams in one day depends on the sales of the ice cream in the previous day. Okay, so what we can do, okay, to exploit this information. So again, the same idea, and then you have here the exercise, and we will we will upload the code of the solutions. Perfect. But you know, if you want to spend a bit of time working on that, we will still be here like five, ten minutes more. Okay, perfect. But besides that, do you have any? Question, general question about pyro probabilistic programming languages that you want to ask? Okay, yes. Well, I mean, I mean, let's see, like, we are not really telling the full story here, okay? But you know, yeah, yeah. tomorrow we'll just have, yeah, we'll tell the full, 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 full story, okay? Yeah. I don't know, what do you think? Yes, I'm sorry, can you, sorry, say again the question? Okay. 
Okay. I mean, she's asking she's whether the humidity and the temperature are de dependent. I mean, it's like, is high humidity associated to high temperature? Oh my God. <laughs> or is high humidity as impacting temperature? Okay. Sorry? I mean, this is a tricky question. This is because that involves a bit of causality and so on. But, but the question, I mean, the main message is, if you think that this guy affect this guy, draw an arrow, update the distribution of this guy, and find a, mod, a, a function that defines the parameters of the distribution of this guy, depending on the values of this other guy. This is your hypothesis. You change your model, observe the data, extract conclusions, you know, and see does it make sense. Sorry? I mean, yes, I mean, the model will be, will be more complex, but fortunately, the kind of inference tools that we have here allow to deal with that. Okay? Perfect. Yes. Sorry? Exactly. So, so he's asking if there is a problem about the tractability of a model which includes like more relationship, like a relationship between this guy and this guy. Of course, I mean, there is an impact. Okay? But uh, the kind of inference algorithm that we are learning here, specifically variational inference, I mean, are able to deal with that. I mean, let me say something. So they will give you an answer, okay? So how accurate this answer will be is going to depend, okay? And tomorrow we will give some insights about that as well, okay? So now that there's so much interest in the weather and the ice cream sales, then maybe just a, maybe just a, one more comment about it because one thing is what you put in your model, but you can also analyze the model and for instance here see that in the model specification, you have that temperature and humidity are actually independent, as you also point out. But if you start to observe the ice cream sales, then you have here a converging connection. And as you saw earlier today with Antonio, then you start to introduce dependencies between these two guys. So the temperature and the humidity. So the dependency that you are looking for is sort of found in the posterior distribution over these guys, uh, the temperature and humidity. So that meaning that if you, for instance, have an ice cream sale and you observe, a, let's say, a low temperature, okay, we need another way to explain this ice cream sales. And then that could be then be explained by the humidity variable. So, so you have this kind of uh, these uh, dependencies that you're looking for in the posterior distribution condition on the ice cream sales that you have. No, so, so, so this is just from the, in, in the model specification as we made it up here that they are marginally independent, uh, as was also pointed out, but that independencies can be introduced by the evidence that you observe. And then the relationships that you're looking for will then start to appear in the posterior distributions, but a priori they are specified in this model here as being independent. I hope that didn't confuse more. <laughs> Yes, yes. Well, I mean, I, I mean, what, uh, let me see. So what happened is like, we are defining this max, okay, which is a trick to do with this, with this problem. I mean, you don't have really to renormalize. Here is lot more like, I mean, you are like searching in the space of parameters and if you cross the border, Okay, this max enforce you to go back. 
Οκ. Δύσεις τι κάνει. No. No. Yes, I mean, uh, I think we, ca we can discuss it. This is a kind of technical question. Do you want to add something? Or? I think we can discuss this technical question. The question really is how much time? Okay, so we, we have to stop. Okay, so thank you for today. Okay, so tomorrow you will have to suffer, Thomas. Uh, I and Helge for the full day, and you know, we will be spending the day looking at the same stuff in kind of a bit more elaborated models, but it's going to be like similar dynamics than today. Okay, so thank you for today. Okay, bye.